أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة ادفع بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميد آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد The 15th of the month of Ramadan in the year 2 after the hijrah of the Holy Prophet peace be upon him from Mecca to Medina serves as the day in which the divine promise was fulfilled. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He revealed in the Quran, in chapter Surah 108, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna a'taynaka al-kawthar, Fasalli li rabbika wanhar. It has been mentioned in the books of tafsir and hadith that when the Prophet, peace be upon him, was in the city of Mecca before his migration, that one day as the Prophet was exiting the masjid, Masjid al-Haram, that a man by the name of Al-As ibn Wa'il from Quraysh, he approached the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and he spoke to the Prophet and he told him something. And then they parted their ways. As Al-As bin Wa'il was leaving the masjid, some of his companions, his friends, they saw him and they told him, what is it that you told Muhammad? What is it that you were speaking with? With Muhammad. He told them that... I was debating with this abtar. He called the Prophet this word, which is abtar, which in Arabic means the childless person, the person that has no children. And of course, during that time, and even in other times, but especially during that time in pre-Islamic Arabia, to be called an abtar was an insult. Why? Because the focus was on progeny, was on family, was on ancestry, was on having children and especially boys to carry the family name. And so not to have a child, not to be able to have a son to carry your name for them was a cause of humiliation. And the reason why he called him this was because history tells us that the Prophet, peace be upon him, along with his wife, as Sayyida Khadija alayhi salam, they bore three boys. They had three boys. One of them was Abdullah, the second was Al-Qasim, and the third was Al-Tahir. And all three of these boys, they died in infancy. So, because of this, the Quraysh, they would humiliate the Prophet. They would assault the Prophet. They would tell him that God has... You are not been given a boy. You have not been given a boy to carry your name. And they saw this as an insult. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He comforted the heart of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And He revealed upon him, He told him, Do not be sad. Verily, we have given you an abundance. Al kawthar means an abundance, a greatness. فَصَلِّي لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرْ And praise your Lord. And praise your Lord and sacrifice in the way of your Lord. إِنَّ شَانِئَكَ هُوَ الْأَبْتَرْ Verily, indeed, your enemy, the one who is humiliating you, he is the one that is childless. 
you will be given an abundance. And this divine promise was fulfilled when Imam al Hassan alayhi salam was born. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad al Wali. On the 15th of the month of Ramadan in the second year, the first grandson of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And the second Imam of whom there was a great abundance through him and through his brother, Al Imam Al Hussein Al Shaheed, alayhi salam. And the rest of the Imams. And so I congratulate you, my dear brothers and sisters, on this joyous occasion, the occasion of the birth of our second Imam. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a blessed occasion for us and our families and to grant us the ability to learn and implement the values and teachings of this great Imam and to allow us the visitation, the ziyara of this Imam in this life and his shafa'ah in the hereafter. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. It never ceases to amaze me when reading about the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Ahlul Bayt, the Imams. It never ceases to amaze me how these individuals, they possessed extraordinary characteristics and the actions that they performed were spectacular. And I'm not talking here about miracles that the Prophet or the Imams, they performed by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because history tells us that the Prophet and the Imams, the Ahlul Bayt, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them the ability to perform certain miracles. But this is not what I'm talking about. And I'm not referring to the Ahlul Bayt's great wisdom and knowledge. They excelled when it came to their wisdom and knowledge, but that's also not what I'm referring to. I'm also not referring to their greatness in worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is also not something that I'm referring to. What I'm referring to, brothers and sisters, yes, the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, the Imams, they excelled in all fields but they were unmatched when it came to their manners and their akhlaq, all of them, unmatched. When we examine their lives, this issue becomes very clear, it becomes crystal clear, that these individuals were endowed with a great sense of morality and manners. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He describes the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, in the Quran, when he gives us the description, he illustrates to us the personality and the character of the Prophet. Yes, he talks about the Prophet's worship. Chapter 20, Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Taha, ma anzalna alayka al Quran li tashqa. Taha, according to our exegetes, according to our hadith, Taha, and Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, Taha is the name, one of the names of the Holy Prophet. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Taha, O Prophet, ma anzalna alayka al-Qur'ana li tashqa. We did not reveal the Qur'an upon you so that you can overburden yourself. How? It is well known that the Prophet, peace be upon him, he would spend much of the night in worship. Some of the ahadith, they tell us, that he would spend so much time in worship to the point where his ankles, they would swell up from standing in worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah tells him, we did not reveal the Qur'an to you so that you overburden yourself when it comes to your acts of worship, to your prayers. In Surah Al-Muzzammil, chapter 73, verse 20, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet, he says, Inna rabbaka ya'lamu annaka taqumu your Lord, He knows very well that you and a group of some of your companions and those around you, that sometimes you would stay up in the night in worship for a third of the night, sometimes for half of the night, sometimes for two-thirds of the night. You would spend in worship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is aware, He sees this. 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for this great act of worship that you do. So yes, Allah, he describes the Prophet by his acts of worship and his sincerity. However, the greatest description to the come in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Prophet, peace be upon him, he says, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Verily, you are of sublime manners and morals. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَى خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ Your akhlaq are great akhlaq. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. And this, in this is a great lesson. Allah tells us that this messenger, that the Ahlul Bayt, they have been endowed with excellent akhlaq. What is akhlaq? When we go to the books of ethics, ethicists and scholars, they tell us that there are two concepts. On the one hand, there is something known as akhlaq. On the other hand, there is something known as adab. And there's a difference between adab and akhlaq. Adab, they tell us, is the outer etiquette. The etiquette. For instance, we have that when we perform the ziyarah, there is certain adab of ziyarah. Right? When it comes to the way that we eat and drink, there is certain adab, there is certain etiquette. We teach our children, right? We tell them that before you eat, it's mustahab to begin with, Bismillah, in the name of Allah. That when you eat, you should eat in cleanliness, that you should not make a mess, that when you want something, you ask, please, you don't reach over the table, for instance, you ask someone to hand you something. That when you end, you end with, Alhamdulillah, that you wash your hands, that you do this, that you do that. There's a certain etiquette, right? This refers to our outer actions. Akhlaq, our scholars tell us, is something that refers to a disposition that in which our outer etiquette and our inner morals are the same. When our external actions and our inner disposition are the same. This is what akhlaq is, and this is the difference between akhlaq and adab. In other words, a person, their akhlaq reflects how they are internally as well as how they are externally. And so, true akhlaq, true akhlaq, true manners are those which have sincerity in them. Because sometimes you may notice that the outer action is just an outer action, it has no core, it has no essence. Take, for example, two individuals, right, in a fundraising event, as an example. You have two individuals. These two individuals, both of them, they take out their checkbook, and they write a check of $5,000, and they contribute. One of them, he may be doing this because of what? Because of external pressure. Because his friend, his, uh, you know, his wife, his husband... He's been being pointed out, you know, the person who is fundraising has pointed him out specifically, right? He's put him on the spot, or he's expected to give. And so he may be donating, but he's doing what? He's doing it for other reasons. Perhaps for selfish reasons, for promotion, for recognition. While the other person may be doing the same act, but he's doing so sincerely. He's doing so because... He understands the significance of generosity. He is doing so for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not for any other sake, not to show off, not to do it for any other reason. It's mentioned in a light-hearted story that there was a young man. This young man, he had reached the age where he was ready to get married. And so he was thinking to himself, who is there that is suitable for me to get married to? I need to find someone to get married to, a good girl to marry her. And so he thought to himself and he thought, how can I find this suitable girl? I want someone who is religious and pious and good and her, she has good hijab and akhlaq and so on and so forth. So he said, you know what the best thing to do is to go to my local masjid, to go to my local mosque. And there, I'm sure that there are certain families who are pious, who are religious, who are observant. And perhaps if I show myself there and introduce myself there, someone from that community will like me and they will introduce me to their daughter. They will offer me their daughter in marriage. So he said, this is a good idea. 
So he went to the masjid. At the masjid, the daily prayers, there's usually a group of friends, elderly uh, uh, friends, elderly men, uncles, who are sitting together. And after the prayers, they sit in the masjid and they talk amongst themselves. And so he said, the best thing to do is to wait and to make sure that when I enter and when I go, that these group of friends, these uncles are there, and I'm sure one of them has a daughter. So he waited. The jama'ah prayer is finished. Everyone left. This group of men were sitting. He entered into the masjid. He came into the masjid, and he was walking very slowly with khushu'. You know, one of the adab of entering the masjid is to do so with khushu', very humbly. And so he entered very humbly. He had his head down in a very pious fashion. And he began to walk slowly towards the mihrab. He went, he carried, he picked up his muh, his turba and the tasbih. And as he was walking, he sought forgiveness. Astaghfirullah rabbi wa atubu alayh. Astaghfirullah rabbi wa atubu And he continued walking. And these group of friends, they were sitting down and they were discussing amongst themselves. And so he continued walking, he came all the way to the front, he put his muh down and he began his prayers, Allahu Akbar. And he began to recite so beautifully, his tilawa was immaculate, reciting so beautifully. The group of men, they noticed, who is this young man? This is the first time we see him. We have never seen such a handsome young man, so pious, so caring, you know, so sincere, so dedicated. Look at the way that he recites the Qur'an. Look at the way that he prays. And they began to tell one another. Each one, they began to tell one another. And they began to speak loudly. And this young man, he's hearing them. As he's praying, he's hearing them. One after another, they are praising him. Oh, this young man is this. This young man does that. This is so beautiful. This is so great. The young man, he became incredibly excited. He couldn't hold himself. He stopped, he turned around, he told them, by the way, I'm fasting too. <laughs> Sincerity, akhlaq, means that our inner disposition and our external actions, they are one. There is no contradiction. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the Prophet, peace be upon him, and the Ahlul Bayt, he says that they had sublime akhlaq, sublime morals. There was sincerity in their hearts. Their intention was the same exact as their action, their external action. There was no contradiction between the two. And although the Ahlul Bayt, they excelled in many fields and they had many different uh, virtuous characteristics and traits, we notice that each and every one of them, there was a specific trait a specific trait which highlighted the noble personality of this figure. When we read the history of the Imams, we notice, yes, they excelled in all fields, but specifically, each one of them was known for a specific trait that highlighted his or her personality. When we come to the life of Al-Imam Al-Hasan alayhi salam, <laughs> historians and scholars, they tell us that the Imam, one of the nicknames or one of the attributes that he was known with was Halim Ahlul Bayt. Halim, not the food, huh? Halim means what in Arabic? Means clemency, the one who has clemency, the one who has kindness, the one who has forgiveness and compassion. Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam, the hallmark of his personality was his great clemency was his great forgiveness, was his great tolerance of others around him. He was known to express great tolerance. Now, why is this significant? Why is this attribute significant? It is significant because when we examine the life of the Imam, we notice that the Imam, peace be upon him, he faced many disturbances and annoyances throughout his life which came under two main forces of aggression. The Imam faced two main forces of aggression. One of the forces of aggression was external, represented by Muawiyah, represented by Bani Umayyah, 
represented by Muawiyah and the Syrian front and his cronies. This was one front. The other front and the other force that the Imam had to face was an internal force. A force of those individuals who lived close to him, who lived around him. Those who considered themselves to be the companions and the followers of the Imam. History tells us that when Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, he decided to make the peace treaty with Muawiyah, what did he do? He made the peace treaty, he set the conditions of the peace treaty. History tells us that some of his closest companions, when they saw this, they felt humiliated. They were confused. They were not sure exactly what was happening. They felt humiliated. And so they came to the Imam and they scolded the Imam. They scolded the Imam. History tells us that some of them, they began to call him very sad names, very disrespectful names. Instead of calling him Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. Some of them, they began to call him Ya Mudhill al Mu'mineen, meaning, oh, the one who humiliated the believers. And these were some of his companions, not his enemies. And so Imam Hassan alayhi salam had to deal with two forces of aggression and annoyance, one which was external and one which was internal. And the Imam, in his great wisdom, he understood that the best line of defense during his time was his attachment to the Qur'anic principles. And when we examine the Qur'an, the Qur'an tells us clearly how to deal with those who annoy us. The Qur'an teaches us how to deal with those who, who ins insult us and humiliate us. The Qur'an teaches us. And many examples are found in the history of the Imam, very popular examples. One example is given that one time the Imam in his home he had a female maid. She came to him and she presented him with some soup, hot soup. And as she was coming, she accidentally poured the soup on the imam. As she was serving the soup, the hot soup to the imam, she accidentally spilled the soup on the imam. History tells us that this maid, she became frightened, she became scared. She thought that the imam was going to scold her, that the imam was going to become angry from her. And so she began to recite verses from the Qur'an. The verses found in chapter 3, Surah Al-Amran, verse 134. She recited to the Imam, she said, وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ And those who suppress their anger. وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ The Imam, he looked up at her and he told her, I have suppressed my anger. Then she con continued the verse, she said, nas," And those who forgive people. And he told her, I have forgiven you. And then she completed the verse and she said, Wallahu yuhibbul muhsineen. And Allah, verily Allah loves those who are righteous. The Imam told her, because of this, I have now set you free. You are free to go. Not only with friends and family members and neighbors, because sometimes some of us, we may say, well, it's easy. My spouse is the person that I live with every day, my children, and it's easy for me to express kindness and compassion. They're my family members. I have to. I have to live with them. So I have to deal with them. I have to forgive them for their faults and their mistakes. They are my family members. They are my blood. They are my friends. But when we examine the life of the Imam, we notice that this was not only his disposition with his family members, but even with his, his uh, foes and his enemies. Those, <clears throat> those who harbored malice and enmity towards the Imam. It is said in a famous event that one day a man from the Syrian province, a man from Sham, during that time Sham was under the control of whom? of Muawiyah and the Umayyads. And the people of Sham, they were programmed with the hatred and animosity of the Ahlul Bayt, and especially the animosity of Imam Ali alayhi salam and his family members. They were programmed. They were taught to hate 
the Ahlul Bayt السلام, History tells us that for decades the Khatib, the one who would give the sermon of the Friday prayers, it was an obligation upon him to curse Imam Ali alayhi salam in his khutbah. And that if he did not do so, the Friday prayers would be considered what? Batil. They would have to repeat. History gives us examples of some khutaba, some speakers. They tell, the history tells us that a couple of them, once they forgot to curse Imam Ali alayhi salam, they went over and they, they redid the entire prayer and the entire sermon because they forgot this point. They were taught to hate the Imam to the point where rumors were going around suggesting that Imam Ali alayhi salam was an individual who did not pray. Can you believe it? The one who was born in the house of Allah and the one who died in the house of Allah and in between his time was spent in the house of Allah, this individual did not pray. But this was the propaganda. This was the media that was, was the media machine at the time. And so the Syrian man, he came from that province and he came to the city of Medina looking for the Imam, Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam. He asked, he said, where is he? They told him he is there. He came, the hadith tells us that he arrived, he noticed that the Imam alayhi salam was sitting on his horse. He was riding his horse. He asked him, are you so-and-so, Hassan, the son of Ali? He told him, yes, I am. He says that when I heard this, I confirmed it was him. I began to insult him and humiliate him. And I, and I said every bad word that I knew, everything that I could think of, I said it towards him. He says, the man himself, he narrates. He says that as I was cursing the imam, the imam remained quiet the entire time. He did not make a single sound. When he finished, when he finished, when he emptied his entire system out, he says that the Imam, he looked at me and he smiled, a beautiful smile. He smiled, he came down from his horse, he approached me in humility and kindness, and he told me, oh man, it seems that you are a stranger, you are a traveler, you are not from this area. It doesn't look like you are from the inhabitants and citizens of Medina. If you are in need of food, if you are in need of clothing, if you are in need of a place to stay, if you are in need of advice, if you are in need of directions, whatever it is that you are in need, tell me I am ready to give you and to offer you. Tell me. Whatever it is you are in need of. The man says, when I heard this reaction, from the Imam, I was so ashamed. I was so embarrassed. I had been told that these individuals were hypocrites and they were this and they were that. But it turned out that they were something else. Who is it that when insulted and humiliated, he repels, he reacts with kindness and generosity? Who does this? Who? And so he says, I was so ashamed that I turned towards the Imam and I told him, my dear Imam, I am embarrassed. I'm so embarrassed, please forgive me for what I did. And the Imam told him, you are forgiven. There are many examples that are given. Another example given from the life of the Imam is that one of his servants, the Imam says in the hadith that the Imam returned home, he came home and he noticed that one of his lambs, the leg of one of his lambs was broken. So he went and he asked the servant, he said, who broke the leg of this lamb? He told him, I did. He said, why? He told him, because I wanted to annoy you. Because I wanted to annoy you. The hadith says the imam, he smiled and he told him, and I want to please you. He gave him money and he told him, you are free to go. This was the akhlaq of the imam. Not only just the family members, but even the foes. This is why history tells us that Marwan ibn al-Hakam, who was one of the greatest enemies of the Ahlul Bayt, one of the greatest enemies of Amir al-Mu'mineen, who fought in the battle of Jamal against the Imam, and who the Imam spared his life, because he came to Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, and he told them, he begged them, he told them, tell your father to spare my life, and they spoke to their father. 
they spoke to their father. This man, who would later on become, become the fourth ruler of the Umayyads, and he did what he did, the disasters that he did, this person, after the Imam alayhi salam was martyred, this person, he came and he participated in the janazah and the funeral of Imam al-Hassan. He went and he carried himself. He carried the body of the Imam, the janazah of the Imam. Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he saw him, he told him, Oh Marwan, what is it that you are doing here? What are you doing participating in the, in the, the burial ceremony, the... the uh, janazah of my brother when only a few days ago you were bothering him and you were annoying him and you were oppressing him Marwan ibn al-Hakam he replies to Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam he says yes I used to do this but I am participating in the funeral of the one whose tolerance outweighed the mountains whose tolerance whose clemency outweighed the mountains this was the akhlaq of Al-Imam Al-Hassan alayhi salam. How? How is it possible, brothers and sisters? How? If we think about our lives, and we think about those who harm us and who insult us, many times we feel the urge to seek revenge. Many times we feel the urge to also annoy them the same way they annoyed us. How is it that a human being is able to overcome this urge and not only not do anything, but to repay with kindness, with generosity, with goodness, with clemency, with forgiveness? How? Two quick reasons. One, brothers and sisters, is that our imams, they differentiated between behavior and being. They made a distinction between, on the one hand, behavior, and on the other hand, being. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He talks about humankind in the Qur'an, He says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَم. Allah says, and we have indeed honored Bani Adam, the children of Adam. Humankind has been honored in the eyes of Allah, exalted in the eyes of Allah. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the creation of the human being, He says, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي Telling the angels, He says, I ha after I have created Prophet Adam alayhi salam, after I have physically created him, and after I have blown into him مِنْ رُوحِي From divine spirit, then what? Then prostrate before him. And so we believe, our Mufassireen, they tell us that in the human being is this potential because we originate from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the creation of Allah. And because we have been infused with this divine spirit, that we have great capacity and great potential for goodness. The human being has a great potential for goodness. And thus, when it comes to how the Imams used to deal with others around them, they would look at this potential, this fitra that each and every human being has been imbued with, infused with. And they would, they would interact with people based on this fitra. They understood that the behavior might itself be wrong. But in order to fix this behavior, that the human being still has a chance they would give this person the chance to transform this negative behavior into positive behavior. Because sometimes when you act with someone in a negative manner, this causes a certain act of rebellion. This causes the person to push back. We see this many times with the way we interact with our youth or our children. If they make a mistake, if they do something wrong, there's a specific way of addressing them. Sometimes, if you scold them in a negative manner, what does this do? This causes more harm than good. This causes them to go further away. This is natural. Every human being, everyone who makes a mistake, even if they realize that they made a mistake, if they are scolded, if they are pushed away negatively, what happens? This causes a negative reaction. And Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, he gives us a great hadith. He says, that we should associate 
and we should treat people in the manner and fashion that we want to be associated with and treated. The golden rule. We have something known as the golden rule. Most uh, religions, most ideologies and religions, they promote what is known as the golden rule. To treat others the way that you would like to be treated. Al-Imam Al-Hassan alayhi salam, he tells us that we should treat others the way that we want to be treated. If one day I make a mistake, I do something wrong, I would expect that people give me a chance. That people try to correct my mistake in a positive manner. And so when dealing with others, this is how I should also deal with them. If we do not differentiate between being and behavior, we run the risk of doing what? Of generalizing. Nowadays, as Muslims, we are victims of generalizations and stereotypes. A small group of thugs somewhere in the world decides to do something crazy, and what? The entire Muslim population is accused. Over 1 billion, 1 and a half billion, 1.6 billion Muslims are accused because of the acts of a small group of people. Why? Because those making these accusations and these generalizations, they are not differentiating between behavior and being. They are associating behavior with being. The act is evil and thus the individual is evil and they generalize. And this is very dangerous. This is why this must be avoided. This is number one. And finally, number two is that the Imam alayhi salam was simply able to control his anger. Simply able to control his anger. The Imam once was asked one day, what is helm? What is clemency? Define for us clemency. He said two things. He said one is the suppression of anger and the second is self-restraint. If you are able to suppress your anger and restrain yourself, then you are able to express clemency and toleration and tolerance for others. Anger is destructive, brothers and sisters. It is a destructive trait. Our master, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salam, he says, al-ghadab, he says, anger is a great evil. Al-ghadab sharrun in atlaqtahu dammar. That evil is a great, uh, that anger is a great evil. If you allow it to, to roam free, it will destroy things. It is a WMD, weapon of mass destruction. If you allow it to go free, it will destroy everything in its path. In another hadith, the Imam says that anger, he defines anger. He says, awwaluhu nadam, it begins, I'm sorry, awwaluhu junoon, it begins with craziness, insanity, wa akhiruhu nadam. And its result, its end result is what? Is remorse and regret. Look at this in our lives. Look at this. Notice anger in our lives, sometimes or in the lives of others. When they become angry, some of them, they lose all control. It's as if nothing can stop them. It's as if they turn crazy. They begin to throw things and smash things and say things without control. And then what? and then give them a little bit of time to die down, to calm down, what happens? They begin to regret, they begin to have remorse. Why did I say this? Why did I do this? I should have controlled myself. I, have, I should have not thrown this plate. I should have not said this. I should have not said that. It begins with uh, uh, insanity, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, and it ends in what? In remorse. And this is why the ahadith they emphasize that we should suppress anger. We should control anger. We should not allow anger to control our, ourselves and our behavior. That we should try our best to perform acts that will help us suppress this anger. And one of the things to do is to what? Is to remember, the hadith says, is to remember the anger and the mercy of Allah. Every time I become angry, let me take a moment to remember the anger of Allah and also the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah wanted to deal with me, and I say this about myself, brothers and sisters. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to deal with me based on justice, I'm in big trouble. 
I'm in big trouble. The dua, we say in the dua, خَيْرُكَ إِلَيْنَا نَازِلْ وَشَرُّنَا إِلَيْكَ صَاعِدْ You, O oh my Lord, goodness descends from you all the time. Blessings and mercy and compassion and goodness. But what do I do in return? What do I send up to you, O oh Allah, in return for this mercy? Faults, diseases of the heart, animosity, hatred, not dealing with our acts of worship in the best manner, deciding to delay our prayers, fasting but constantly complaining, I'm hungry and I'm thirsty and, and. This is what we send up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah decides to deal with us based on His justice, many of us would be in big trouble. But Allah deals with us in mercy. And Allah tells us, I also want you to deal with the creation with mercy. Remember my mercy. The hadith tell us, do something positive. When you become angry, try to take this force and transform it into something positive. It's said that a man and a woman, a couple, married couple, they would get into frequent arguments. And when they would get into the arguments, they would each yell at one another. The man would yell, the woman would yell, they would insult each other. But the woman, she had a little bit of a worse temper. And so she would say all these bad things. She would curse him and say, you are this and this and son of this and daughter of that. And so she would continue to curse him and sometimes she would even get violent, physically violent. So they, one day they got into a big argument and her husband, he told her, he said, listen, honey, I think we need to find a solution. This is a problem. We need to find a solution. And I recommend that you go and you take some anger management courses. So she told him, okay. She went and she enrolled in anger management courses. The days went by. After a few days, once again, they got into an argument. The man, as soon as the argument began, he, you know, he began his uh, duck and cover protocol. And so he tried to find somewhere to hide, but he noticed that his wife was quiet. She wasn't throwing anything. She wasn't yelling. She wasn't saying anything. So he was a little confused. He told her, what's going on? How come you're not saying anything? You're not doing anything. She told him, well, I went and I enrolled in anger management courses. And they told me that when I get angry, I should go and I should take this out into something positive. I should do something constructive with this anger that I have to transform, to transform it into positive energy. And so this is what I do. He told her how. She said, every time I become angry, I go into the house and I clean the house, the entire house. I go to the bathroom and I clean the bathroom from top to bottom. So he thought to himself, he said, but how does, you know, how is that positive? How is it, you know, how are you able to release this anger in a positive way? She told him, oh, because I use your toothbrush. <laughs> so inshallah, the dear brothers tonight, on your way home, you buy a replacement toothbrush just in case to transform, to do something positive, to suppress this anger, not to allow the anger to control. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and I'll end with this hadith. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he says that the strong person is not the person who is able to tackle people down, to wrestle with them. The one who has you know, a great body and muscles, this is not the strong person. The strong person is the one who is able to suppress his anger, who does not allow his anger to tackle him down and tackle down others. This is the strong person. This is what the Prophet tells us. The month of Ramadan, brothers and sisters, is an opportunity for us to develop this strength of will. When we are able to abstain from eating and drinking and doing other things, this gives us strong willpower, brothers and sisters. But what is more important than abstaining from food and drink is abstaining from doing things that will destroy our morality, that will destroy our akhlaq. This is why so much emphasis is placed on having good akhlaq when we fast. This is the lesson that we learn. And these are the lessons that we learn from great individuals, the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam, and from the Imam whom tonight we celebrate his birth, Al-Imam Al-Hasan Al-Mujtaba alayhi salam.
In the end, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Almighty, to accept our fasting, our prayers, our supplications, our seeking forgiveness during these holy days and nights. I ask Allah, the Almighty, to bestow His peace and blessings upon those who are suffering around the world. As you are well aware, there are many believers suffering, brothers and sisters, Muslims who are suffering around the world in various parts. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow His peace upon them during these holy days and nights. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow a full and speedy recovery upon those who are ill, those who are sick, those who have asked us to pray for them. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow His mercy and forgiveness upon the souls of those who have passed away and to hasten the reappearance of our final Imam Al-Hujjat ibn Al-Hasan Al-Mahdi Ajjalallahu ta'ala farajahu al-Sharif wa ila arwah al-mu'minin wa al-mu'minat نهدي جميعا ثواب سورة الفاتحة مع الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله